Awesome. So if you weren't here a fortnight ago, we went through Ephesians 1. So we're doing a series uh, through the book of Ephesians. We've called it A New Way to Be Human. And it's not like we're reinventing the wheel. We're just reminding ourselves of the new life that Christ has given us. So throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul presents kind of this idea. Paul, who was uh, one of the writers of the New Testament, he wrote the book of Ephesians, uh, he kind of presents this idea of a new type of human, a new humanity that contrasts with the old way. And basically what he says is the Christian life is this new humanity and living like the world is the old humanity. And uh, in Ephesians 1, we kind of drew out some ideas that God invites us into a new family. So he gives us a new home. He gives us a new inheritance and he gives us a new purpose. So we have a place to belong, something to look forward to and something to do. And then in Ephesians 2, he kind of builds on that. Ephesians 1 is like really encouraging and uplifting and he starts Ephesians 2 with a bit of a bang. Um, But we're going to work through that and we're going to look at this idea that Paul presents in Ephesians 2 that we are invited to be part of this new temple. So tonight's message is called A New Temple. And there's three things we're going to pull out of that. One is that there's a new sacrifice. The second is that there is a new unity. And the third thing, I've just had a mental blank, is that there's a new way of worship. So that's the things we're going to look at tonight. And as we go through Ephesians, we should expect there to be a few points of collision, a few clashes in us as the old way of living, as the things of this world that maybe even as a Christian you're still hanging on to come into collision with the Word of God and come into collision with the truth of who Jesus is because the new should trump the old. The new should overtake the old. The kingdom of light that Jesus is the king of should overcome and does overcome the kingdom of darkness. So just brace yourselves for that. Because God's ways are not our ways. And the things that we think should be are not always what God says they are. And so as we kind of, I guess, work our way through Ephesians, there will be these continual points of clash where the word of God hits the way of the world and we see what Jesus does with that. All right, let's pray and then let's get into it. Father God, Thank you so much that you love us. Thank you that you died so that we could know you, so that we could be brought from death to life. Thank you, Jesus, that you died so that we could live free, free from bondage, free from sin, free from death, free from shame. And Lord Jesus, just pray tonight that as I speak, as we hear your word, as we meditate, that by the Holy Spirit you would teach us. You would lead us into truth and you would show us how to live. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, the other day, Elliot and I drove to church together. So that's Elliot there. He was playing the drums. Um, and he drove. He came and picked me up. And I really appreciated that. That was a really lovely thing for him to do. Um, and I trusted that Elliot would get us to church Um, physically, emotionally, and mentally healthy. And for the most part, he did. But we had an incident. So the drive started well. We were listening to um, some late 90s worship bangers um, and singing along, which was a really joyful thing. And, um, And we were just cruising through the hills, exactly on the speed limit, not above, not below. And, um, and then there was an incident. And sort of as we were, we were driving along, we were on kind of a straight. And up ahead, on the other side of the road, was a magpie. And the magpie was just sitting there, pecking the concrete. I don't know. It was <laughs> eating a dead possum. I don't know. The magpie was there. And, um, and we were on the other side of the road. And we were just traveling along. And approaching us, coming the other direction, was a car. And it was coming towards the magpie, and the magpie was not moving. And I was kind of like, oh, that magpie's just chilling. It's really 
quite stationary while that, that car's coming towards it. Um, and we got closer, and the other car got closer, and, and we got closer, and the other car got closer, and closer and closer. And then finally, I was like, oh, thank goodness. The magpie starts flapping its wings. It gets, up, it's, gets a bit of height. It starts flying, and it flies straight in front of us. And Elliot killed it. <laughs> and to, avo like, to avoid it, though, to be fair, to avoid it, we would have either had to hit the other car or fly off the road. And neither of those options was particularly good. So, so he took out the magpie, and the magpie was dead. I looked in the rearview mirror, and it was just a puff of feathers. And, um, and that was a little distressing. We both just kind of, like, oh, I think we were singing shout, at, shout to the Lord at the time. And we were, <laughs> oh, okay, felt that, and continue on. But as I was preparing the message tonight, and I was thinking about how that bird was dead. <laughs> That's what Paul says we were. Oh. He says, the start of Ephesians 2, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So these first three verses of Ephesians 2 are a bit, they're uncomfortable. They're challenging. Paul paints a fairly startling picture of the state of humanity without Jesus. He says, you're dead, you're disobedient, you are by nature a child of wrath. And you might read that, and I know I did, like kind of the first time, it's like, no, surely not. That's a bit, calm down, Paul. You've just talked about how we're brought into this new family of Christ, into this joyous inheritance, and now you're saying we were dead? But that's the reality. That if you don't know Jesus as your Lord that you're dead, like a magpie. <laughs> You've just been hit by a Kia Serrata. <laughs> and throughout the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was, was given the law and the commandments and a way of kind of dealing with this sin problem um, that kind of allowed them to live as the people of God. They were, they were given kind of a, a worship structure, and I'm certainly not going to go into that in any great depth. Um, but as we've heard, Deuteronomy is a good place to go, and Nick would love to run you through uh, the ins and outs of Old Testament tabernacle worship. I'm not going to do that. But basically what, what, what had to happen is, is once a year there was this day for the nation of Israel called the Day of Atonement, and the nation of Israel were were kind of, they were the people group that God chose to bless. He chose to set them apart, to show them this is how to live. He created this, this kind of section, this law, this way to be that was in contrast to the, to the nation around them. But, but on this day, once a year, called the Day of Atonement, they, uh, it would have been an absolute mess, but they basically sacrificed all these animals and they, they spread their blood around. I'm sorry, this is, this is full on, but it's just in the Bible. And, uh, and basically what had to happen is there was this atonement for their sins. So they would say at the end of the, like the, end of the year, at the point in time, they would sacrifice the animals. They would shed blood because they had this knowledge that sin leads to death. And for sin to be atoned for, blood needs to be spilt. And so part of this kind of wrestle for us now as Christians, this kind of wrestle for mankind is that to accept Jesus as Lord, we have to kind of come to the point where we realize that our sins lead to death, that sin equals death. And in the Old Testament, they atone for that death by following the law and by sacrificing animals and shedding blood. But that's not where we stand. But God, in verse 4, 
It's all right, it uplifts. It's okay. <laughs> Paul writes, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Even when we were dead, he made us alive. The Christian is made alive with Christ. The same life that resurrected Christ from the grave, the same life that Jesus lives that overcomes sin and death, that is the life that you have been given if you trust Jesus as Lord. Where there was death, there's life. Where there was bondage, there's freedom. So there's this new sacrifice. No longer do we have to go through the pains of killing animals and shedding blood and following this letter of the law. But this new sacrifice, Jesus has done that for us. And so knowing that without him we are dead, we can go, okay, his blood has been shed so that I can be alive. And, it, and, and in Ephesians 2 here, it, said, like, it makes reference to the devil, the prince of the power of the air. And he wants you to believe that you still have to pay the price. He wants you to believe that you are stuck, that you are still dead. But Christ has made you alive. So God is rich in mercy. So even though we're not necessarily good enough, he is so good. And he's so much better. And he knows that we can't do it, so he takes our place and he says, welcome, you are my child. And just to finish off this like first, first section in verse 10, It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this new life we've been given, it's not just for us, but it comes out of us into good works. And I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. The order in this is so important. You don't do good works to get saved. You don't do good works to enter the home. You don't do good works to become a Christian. When you're a Christian and you know who you are and you know who your king is, then you will do good works. But you've got to get that order right because otherwise it's just religion. Christ made you alive. Yes, thank you. (laughs) There's something in that. (laughs) This is a good thing, guys. (laughs) And sometimes we have to wrestle with the state of where we were before so that we can appreciate what Christ has done in us now. So we've been freed from bondage, freed from sin, and free to be united to Christ and with his people. So there's this new unity that we've been brought into. So growing up, I played football, and I used to play for a team called the Bloods. And it's a bit of a theme tonight, but we were called the Jervois Bloods, um, a bunch of farm boys. And we had a rival team. So we were from Jervois, which is just a little town on the river, and we hated this team called the Imperials. And they're from, you know, the big city of, of Murray Bridge that we, <laughs> city folk. And, uh, and we hated them. And every time, like every time we played them, there was like this pep talk moment where the coach would get us in and remind us of all the terrible things that they do, you know. They're awful. They drown kittens. Beat them up. I don't know, whatever. But like he would try and like really rev us up and, you know, we, we'd get pretty into it. Like, 14-year-olds don't need much. And, uh, and there would be fights. There would be chaos. Um, they would always flog us because we were terrible. But if we, if we walked off feeling like we'd kind of, you know, stuck it to them a bit, then that was a good result. That's my very bad analogy to describe the separation between Jews and Gentiles. So... <laughs> so. So the Jews, the Israelites, the people of God, they followed God's law, and that's what made them clean. And the Gentiles were every single other person that didn't. So 
most of us here, I'm going to assume, would have found ourselves in the Gentile camp, not in the people of God, not clean, not following the law, other, on the outside. In uh, verse 13 through to 18, Paul writes, and he's writing specifically to Gentiles here. And it's another but moment. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself a new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. And through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So there's this sense that the lines of separation that had been drawn have now been erased. They've been broken down. No longer were some kind of in and others out, but through Jesus and through his spilt blood and through his work on the cross, everyone, everyone was invited into the people of God. For the Jews, this was scandalous. And for the Gentiles, it was miraculous. Worship would never be the same again. Because a Gentile could live as part of the Jewish community, but they could never fully be part of that community. They could never have the full experience of worship in the way that the Jews could. But Jesus made a way. So tonight, if you feel like you're far off, if you, you feel like you're one of those people that you're like, oh, I'm a long way from God. I don't look it. Maybe I look right. But I am, in my heart, I'm feeling a very long way away. Know that he has brought you near. If you are far off, he has brought you near. This unity is for us to be in relationship with one another. It's important that when people see the church, when people see Christians, they see unity, not division. I said this two weeks ago. Christ calls us to unity. He doesn't call us to uniformity. We don't all look the same. We don't all act the same. We do different things but we have the same spirit, we have the same Jesus, we have the same Lord, and that's just so important. Jesus said to his disciples, by by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we're called to unity, we're called to love one another. And I've heard it said in church before, oh yeah, Jesus calls us to love each other, but we don't have to like each other. And I would just challenge you on that, if, if you've thought that, or if you believe that, Have you ever loved someone you didn't like? Because I haven't. And so when we we look at people and go, I don't like them, then we have to pray to God and say, God, give me your heart for that person. Show me how to love that person. Show me how to have unity with that person so that I can like them and I can love them. Because that's just so important. And in a world that is increasingly drawing lines around beliefs, and separating groups and creating division, we need to be more unified than ever before. That the world would see our love for one another and they would go, what is that? And imagine what that might do in this community. In your families, in the Adelaide Hills. Just imagine what might happen if when people saw the church, they didn't see religion or weirdness or oh, all these different groups, but they saw unity. It'd be incredible. <laughs> so we've been given access to the same spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's the seal of your eternal inheritance. And now, now we can worship all together. So there's this new way of worship. 
In verse 19, it says, So then you who are no longer strangers and aliens, so still talking to the Gentiles here, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul presents this idea that we, together in unity, by the power and sacrifice of Christ, are being made together as a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the cornerstone of the temple, this new temple, the church, but we are all added to it. And so if the temple was the place of worship for the Old Testament, what is the worship of this new temple? Worship is not bound to a physical place. We don't go to church to worship. We are the church and we worship. Did you get that? You don't go to church to worship, singing songs in church. I mean, it's part of worship, but that's not worship. That's not what worship is. Your whole lives, if you're a Christian, are worship. So you might say, well, how does that work? And what is that? And what does that look like? Well, in John 4, 24, and Jesus has this encounter with a, with a woman. There's a woman at the well, and I'm not going to tell the whole story, but they're talking about like worship in the temple and things like that. And in verse 24 of John 4, Jesus says, he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And I'm mainly talking, like if you're not a Christian here tonight, you might find this interesting, but I'm really, I'm talking to the Christians specifically right now. I'm talking to people who would, who would say, yep, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus. Okay, let's just, let's just listen in. So if you want to worship Jesus in the way that he says that you need to do it, you need to do it in spirit and in truth. We receive the spirit when we confess Jesus as Lord. So if you are a Christian, if you have put your faith in Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's happened, okay? And sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it could get a little weird depending on who you're listening to. And sometimes, you know, there's stuff that people will say about what the Holy Spirit does that is maybe well-intentioned, but it's not actually what the Bible says about him. So let's see what Jesus says about the Spirit. So in John 16, 13 to 15, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives will point us to truth. It will point us to the truth of Jesus. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives will glorify Jesus. And sometimes you might hear people talk about the Holy Spirit and they talk about power and they talk about uh, all these amazing things that you're going to do and all that kind of stuff. And while... Yes, the Holy Spirit does amazing things through us. The point isn't that we would do things. The point is of the Holy Spirit is that we would know Jesus. That's why Jesus calls him the Spirit of truth. Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. So the Spirit is there to guide us into the truth of Jesus. Therefore, if we're going to worship in spirit and truth, the words we sing matter. What we sing about Jesus matters. They need to reflect the character and person of God. The prayers that we pray matter. They should be in alignment with the truth of who he is. The way we speak about Jesus must be true. And you might say, well, I don't know what's true about God. I don't know what God is like. I don't know what God likes. 
I don't know what his preferences are. Uh, There's an interesting thought I had a couple of years ago. I heard it in a sermon, like someone was saying, like, did you know that God has like things he likes and doesn't like? And I was like, huh, I never thought about that. But it's true. We've got a whole book of it. (laughs) And he tells us how he likes people to respond to him and how he likes to engage with people. And so, for example, I know uh, my wife, Jasmine. We've known each other for 13 or 14 years. We've been married for nearly 10. And I know what she likes and I know what she doesn't like. For example, she doesn't like it when I interrupt her or when I leave stuff around or when I don't recycle. But she does like when I tend to her needs or I engage in meaningful conversation or when I do my share around the house. How do I know that? Well, we've talked about it. (laughs) If I do something she doesn't like, she tells me. If I um, didn't listen to her, then I will know about it. If I don't recycle, I'll know about it. For example, I know that because we've had a relationship and we've spent time on our relationship. And if you're serious about a relationship with God, then you will spend time on that relationship and you will seek to find out what God likes. And you will seek to find out how God works. And how do you do that? Well, you read the Bible and you pray. This is nothing new. This is what they tell you from Sunday school up. You read the word. What does Jesus actually say? What does God do all through human history? There's a consistency there and it's ours to understand So if you want to worship in spirit and truth, then you read the Bible and you read what Christians have historically believed about the Bible. Not something that's been around for 10 minutes, but something that's been around for hundreds of years that we've agreed on. And that's how you know what's true. And that's how you know how to worship. In Romans, Paul says that we are called to be living sacrifices. Our whole lives are worship. So think about that. If your whole life is worship, then everything that you do is worship, then sometimes the things you do as worship will be acceptable to God and sometimes the things you do as worship will not be acceptable to God. If your whole life is worship and if you have that kind of mind, the the switch flicks and you go, oh, like my whole life is worship, I'm a living sacrifice, everything I do is before a holy God and for a holy God, then the way we live will start to change. And this isn't, I'm not saying this to bring condemnation. I'm not saying this to make you go, oh, I'm not worshiping God very well, but just to go, oh, maybe there's things I can do differently. When our lives are in step with the spirit and in the truth, then we will live lives as worship that are acceptable to him. So what does all this mean? Well, Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. He shed blood to pay for our sins so that we could walk in freedom to be unified together and with God and so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. So three kind of questions to leave you with tonight. Three kind of points where you might find yourself. Um, One, have I accepted the sacrifice of Jesus and accepted him as Lord? And we've got to start there. Jesus knew you from before creation. It says he predestined you and chose you to be adopted as his son or daughter. He knew that you didn't have necessarily what it took and he said, well, I will take your place. I will die so that you can live and so that you can know me and so that you can walk in freedom with me. And to know Jesus is Lord is to say, God, I'm a sinner. I've stuffed up. I need you. Show me how to live. And then he does. And he's faithful to that. 
So that's the first thing. The second thing is, am I walking in unity with the people around me, helping to build the temple of Jesus? So am I in unity with my friends who are Christians? Am I in unity with the people in this room? Have I got conflict or issues that if people saw us, they would say, they don't seem to love each other very well. And all that's complicated and hard and and forgiveness is hard and, and all of that stuff is messy, but we're still called to do it. Just because things are hard and messy doesn't mean we leave them. And the third thing, am I offering my whole life as acceptable worship to Jesus? So worship isn't the moment where you come and sing in church. Worship is every step of every day. And for some of you, there might be like a big shift in your thinking. And you're just like, whoa, okay, that's, that's big. And as I've wrestled through this over the last couple of months preparing, I've gone, yeah, this is, this is a big call. But God has grace for us. He doesn't leave us to do it on our own. That's why he gives us the spirit so that we can know him, so that we can live in a way that's pleasing to him. Can I have the band come up? Why don't you guys stand? Jesus loves you. He paid for you for your freedom so that you are free to worship and you are free to offer your life as a living sacrifice. If you're here tonight, I'm just going to go back to the point I made earlier. If you're here tonight and you feel far off, from God, whether like you're like, oh, I'm not a Christian at all, so I don't really know what you're talking about, and I am far away from God. Or if you are, as a Christian, feeling far off, just know He's brought you near. You might feel far off, but you are not. Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows pain. He knows betrayal. He knows those things. And he says, trust me. I'm with you. I have life for you. So you don't have to stay dead. You don't have to stay bound. You can actually walk free. So we'll have people available to pray with you if you'd like in any of these kind of areas tonight well let's just pray as we as we close father god thank you so much for your word thank you so much that you love us so so much that you would give us your word to teach us to uh to call us to more to show us what how you would have us live and to show us a new way of living and lord we thank you lord i just pray that you would meet us where we are tonight. You give us what we need. We love you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name.